Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Tonight we take a look at Exodus chapter 21 through 17. So listening to those commandments again, focusing this time on the word coveting. Please join me in prayer. Father, it is so natural for us to covet because of our sin. Help us, O oh Lord, to be content with what you have given us and how you have made us. Help us, O oh Lord, to be set free from the taskmaster of coveting. And let us, O oh Lord, belong to the benevolent Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise in Christ. Tonight, we continue our series titled, Let My People Go. During the Latin season, we have been focusing on those things which have a grip on us, those things which are cruel taskmasters over us, from which we need to be free. Tonight, we look at the cruel taskmaster of coveting. Having survived the toddler years now twice over, the following toddler property laws bring back memories. Well, it's working there we go. You probably know them if you've had young children. If I like it, it's mine. If it's in my hand, it's mine. If I can take it from you, it's mine. If I had a little while ago, sorry, but it's mine too. It must never, ever appear to be yours in any way, shape, or form because it is always and forever mine. That's the toddler rule. Let's be honest, though. Does that just apply to small little children, or that can also apply to sinful adults? We can be just like little kids sometimes, can't we? Deep down within all of us, there exists an insatiable desire to look at someone's lawnmower, bike or boat, patio or porch or car, Indeed, just about anything and everything that belongs to someone else, I long for them all to be mine. We are in a series on the book of Exodus. Today, we come to the most famous part of the book, the Ten Commandments. There are two commandments that address the sin of coveting. Not one, two. God repeats what is most important. The Ninth and Tenth Commandments are the most important part of the Ten Commandments. Why would I say that? When you think about the first table of you shall have no other gods before me, you can make the case on this. Every sin begins with coveting. Coveting God's power is a violation of the first commandment. Coveting our neighbor's belongings, their reputation, their life is a violation of the second table. Coveting is not wanting things, it's not consisting of having goals. No, it's natural to want things, and it's good that we have goals to work toward for our future. There's nothing wrong with wanting things, nothing wrong with having goals, nothing wrong at all. Coveting, though, on the other hand, says, I will do whatever it takes to get it, even if I have to lie, cheat, and steal, I will get it. Coveting really convicts the heart and mind. It helps us understand how far we are away from the glory of God and the image in which we were created. Coveting seems to have a course of its own within our mind. It helps us know that we are sinners, not just in word and deed, but in thought. Coveting calls it like it is. Even St. Paul says the same thing. He really did not know sin until he understood the sin against coveting. It speaks to the depravity of the human heart. Coveting is why we worship other gods, like our job, our paycheck, and our social status. Coveting is why we fail to honor our parents, kill people with our words, and look with lust, lie, cheat, and steal. I want it all, all to be mine. How can we deal with our titanic desire to acquire everything? How can we become more obedient to God's word and will? How? How can we break the stranglehold of looking at all things and all people and always thinking mine? How can we be set free from the cruel taskmaster of coveting? The fact is, coveting is natural for sinners. Coveting comes with sinful nature. Being content, though, does not come naturally. Being content is something that we learn. 
See what St. Paul says. He, by the grace of God, learned it. He once said, I have learned. It's not come naturally, but I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. St. Paul was content in whatever situation his loving father had placed him. Being content conquers coveting every single time, like rock smashes scissors. How does it work? Well, usually, we start with rationalizing the sequence of coveting. We sometimes think coveting, uh, no big deal. But realize here the sequence in the fall. Then the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye. She coveted it for gaining wisdom, and then she took it and ate it. You see the three words in bold there? That's the sequence. See, covet, take. Achan also had wrongfully taken the spoils of war which belonged to God. And for that, the enemies of Israel defeated them in battle. When it was revealed to Joshua the reason for their defeat, Joshua confronted Achan about his wrongdoing. Achan confessed, I saw among the spoils a beautiful mantle from Shinar, and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels. And I coveted them, and I took them. See the sequence? Saw, covet, take. That's the sequence which gets us in trouble. How often do we then rationalize our coveting? We just kind of say, ah, I'm just looking. But as you can see, looking easily leads to coveting. Coveting leads to taking. And what does taking lead to? We hear in James 1.15, desire. If your desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully growing, gives birth to death. Now there is the fourth part of the sequence. See, covet, take, die. When we covet our neighbor's trophy spouse, it brings death to marital joy. When we covet each other's skills, intellect, popularity, family connections, you name it, it brings death to our inner peace. We're not happy unless we have it. When we covet our neighbor's BMW, Rolex watch, looks, pick your poison, it brings death to our relationship with Jesus. Reed Lessing was in fourth grade when his parents gave him a bike for Christmas. I'll check that. It was more than just a bike. His parents gave him a Stingray bike. Maybe well, you remember those days. You know how it had flared handlebars, chrome on the side. And get this, it had that banana seat, and you had those banners flying as you hustled and bustled on that bicycle. Upon receiving the bike, he said the song by Steppenwolf came to mind. Get your motor running, heading on the highway, looking for adventure. I was born to be wild. He was born to be wild until he went to his friend Greg Heinstead's house. Unfortunately, his parents had topped Reed's parents. Greg Heinstead's parents gave him a red Schwinn 10-speed bike. Get that? 10-speed. When he saw Greg's red Schwinn 10-speed bike, his motor died. <laughs> Left unchecked, coveting drives a stake into our heart, kills us. Just ask Eve. Just ask Achan. Just ask James. After desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. Being content conquers coveting. So, here's the first step to being content. Realize, do not rationalize, realize the sequence of see, covet, take, and death. See the law. Second, personalize your salvation. Exodus 22 says, say what that one's, Gary, thank you. 
I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. I, in the Lord your God, am a zealous God. I am the Lord your God, not her God, not his God, not their God, not some God, not any God. Yahweh the Lord is your God. Exodus 25 says, I, the Lord your God, am a zealous God. Your zealous God will do whatever it takes to save you, to set you free from this taskmaster. He will do whatever it takes to free you. He did it for you, though, not like with the Ten Commandments or not like with the plagues of Egypt with fleas, flies, and frogs. He set us free through the Passover lamb. Christ's blood was not splattered on the wood of a house, but on the wood of an instrument of death mingled with sweat, soldiers spit, and cheap wine. It all ended crucified, dead, and buried. Watch as Joseph of Arimathea places Christ into the garden tomb. Smell the stench of death. See the confines, the darkness, the sealed stone. Feel the utter hopelessness. Now, witness the charred marks of divine explosion to life. There is nothing dead about our Jesus. Jesus blew the rock open from the inside rolled away the stone. Jesus lives so he can speak these words straight from his heart to yours. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of sin and death, out of the house of slavery. I, the Lord your God, am a zealous God. I will do whatever it takes to save you and free you. Being content conquers coveting. The first step again to being content is this. Do not rationalize the sequence. Realize where it all leads, death. The second step, do not just generalize your salvation. Personalize it. Make it your own. Jesus is the Passover lamb who saved you. Singular, you. God freed us from the cruel past massacre of coveting through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. However, we have to admit that God has created human creatures with a sense and a need to belong to someone. So if we have been set free from the cruel taskmaster to coveting, to whom do we now belong? Scripture tells us we belong to God. God said to the cruel taskmaster of coveting, let my people go so we can belong to the benevolent Lord Jesus Christ. God says to us all, Out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. The Hebrew word, segula. God's desire to acquire us is infinitely greater than ours. From the depths of his loving heart, the Lord says, you are always and forevermore my segula. God wants us, warts and all. God always says, you are my first choice. Not second, not third, first choice. In your baptism, God made you his first choice. His choice was not obligatory, required, compulsory, forced, or compelled. God chose you freely because God loves you. God looks at you in great love and says, you are my prized, priceless possession. Segula. Imagine that. The temptation, though, is to trivialize Segula. What's the big deal? Do not trivialize, but internalize segula. Let it go deep down into your bones, into every fiber of your being, this truth. You are God's prized, priceless possession. What else can top that? The heart of the Ten Commandments. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. How does that work? The sequence. See, covet, take. Second, personalize your salvation. Make it yours, because it is yours. It belongs to you, not because you've earned it, but it's been gifted to you by your benevolent Lord. And you belong now to him. Internalize the segula, the prized possession of God. And where is the power to do all this? The strength, the want to, they all come from gospel words such as these. 
I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are always and forevermore lovingly, passionately, eternally mine. In his name, amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We receive.